Hello, everyone. Mike's working. Um, well, thanks for all being here today, and thanks for those joining uh, from wherever you are in the world. Um, thanks for taking the time. My name's Matt Homewood, um, also known as an urban harvester. And today, I'll be talking about supermarket food waste and its impact on the environment, and especially climate change. A bit about me, I'm half French, half English, grew up in London, great to be back in Scotland. I did three years down the road at Edinburgh University where I did zoology, before moving on to Denmark where I studied um, climate change. And it's in Denmark where I got introduced to the concept of urban, urban harvesting. So let's have a show of hands here, please, and don't be shy. Who's ever heard of urban harvesting before? Okay, a couple people. Maybe dumpster diving is a more familiar concept for you. Okay, a few more hands. So for those of you who don't know, this is dumpster diving. You literally dive into supermarket dumpsters to see what food might be available. And I've got a short video to give you a better idea of okay, what that is. Take it out. Um, just my local dumpster. And what do I see? I see six huge slabs of meat that have come from Uruguay on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Look at this gold mine. We've got so much yogurt. We've got avocados from Kenya. We've got organic carrots. We've got some salads. So the concept is pretty simple. Instead of going into the supermarkets I used to shop, I'm now going round the back and seeing what's available in the dumpsters. And you might be shocked to see what's available. We've got blueberries on the left, an entire uh, bin of pita bread. We've got bananas from the Dominican Republic. Every single day, dumpsters all across Copenhagen were full of perfect food that had been shipped in from across the planet. Quickly became addicted, as you can imagine, as I was saving a fortune, and then I was reducing my own impact on the planet by dropping out the formal economy to an extent. But I was absolutely shocked by the amount of meat that was dumped out every single day. Chicken, pigs, cows, you name it, that cut of meat was in the dumpster, many of which weren't even reduced. So it got to a point where I thought, goodness, I am going to have to do something about this because in Copenhagen, at least, supermarket food waste is completely out of control. And so in 2019, I set up my page called An Urban Harvester. The goal was simple. For every single day, I dumpster dive by bicycle alone at my three local supermarket dumpsters. I'd go to the dumpsters, see what I can find, bring home a portion of that food, and take good photographs to really visualize that this food waste was not waste at all, and it was absolutely perfect. Um, so I'd share these photos on social media networks to see if people responded to this economic scandal, essentially. And yeah, it was by bicycle and alone. So that's the emphasis. It's not to boast. It's to really emphasize that this is the tip of the food waste iceberg in Copenhagen, at least. So I'd be bringing back slippers made in China, toothpaste, baguettes, blueberries, dried chickpeas, cans of tuna, cans of tomatoes, matchsticks, you name it, it was in the dumpster. Entire boxes of food that hadn't even been unpackaged were being, uh, were being dropped in the local supermarket dumpsters. We've got prawns, we've got egg mayonnaise, we've got slices of ham and beef, 45 pizzas, apple juice, ketchup, mayonnaise, fruits and vegetables from right across the planet, but especially Italy and Spain here in Europe. We've had 300 tubs of cow cream, 180 bags of coffee, and an absolute banquet of pork every single day because Denmark is one of the world's leading pig producers on the planet. 30 million pigs per year for 6 million people. That's 22 times the number of pigs uh, per capita than the USA, believe it or not, and a good portion of that ends up in the supermarket dumpster. Many of those items aren't even reduced. 800 eggs. There were 2,000 in the dumpster, but because I was by bicycle, I could only bring back 800. And so from this point onwards, I started to focus more on meat, dairy, and eggs, because we know that that has a massive impact. 80% of the global calories 
from uh, animal products um, use up 83% of the global farmland. And so from this point onwards, I started focusing much more on that. And it was a dirty job. The blood, the stench, the whole chickens, the, raw, the, the pork joints, the beef. Um, it got to a stage where I was bringing back so many fo uh, meat, uh, so much meat that my vegetarian girlfriend almost kicked me out the apartment. And it's worth emphasizing, I've got 4,000 photos on my Instagram. I'm only showing a small selection today uh, for time's sakes. Um, and the day I'll never forget, 157 packets of bacon that hadn't even been reduced, but they passed their best before date. I worked out that that was five pigs worth of bacon in my small local supermarket in Copenhagen. So my next question, what do you reckon that was? Well, in Copenhagen, we've got an epidemic. What is happening in the rest of this country? And the answer came to me from a lady who goes by the name of the dumpster diving diva. Uh, f funny stat, most dumpster divers, at least on social media, are female, and many actually anonymous. Um, don't ask me why, but that is something I've noticed over these last three years. Look at all this food. At least it's been reduced, but has it been reduced enough and in good time in relation to that legal best before date? That dumpster suggests not. So my next question, of course, is if this is all happening in one of the most sustainable countries on the planet, Denmark, what on earth is happening across the rest of this planet? So when I got uh, the invitation from COP to speak um, about supermarket food waste, I reached out to my network. I said, folks, what are you seeing in your local supermarkets wherever you live? And remember, most uh, countries go to, well, most supermarket companies go to great lengths to hide all this stuff. So again, this is the tip of the food waste iceberg. But let's go on a global tour to see what is being dumped across the West. Sydney, Australia. Belgium, from an anonymous group of dumpster divers. Estonia, two dumpsters full of perfect fruit. Finland, full of uh, cream and feta cheese. Germany. Germany is one of the craziest countries in Europe, and you can see this person's kitchen absolutely inundated with perfect food. New Zealand. Then we've got Norway, uh, one of the worst food waste uh, 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 countries in Europe. Uh, 16 packets of beef that, and pork that haven't been discounted. Poland. My friend Anna in Portugal. Sweden, and Sweden's an interesting one. If we look on the left-hand side here, we've got products from the leading retailer called Ica. And Ica are being celebrated here at the COP for their Beyond Climate Neutrality Scheme. They were carbon neutral in 2020, they say. And I know they waste a lot of food, because I follow a lot of Swedish dumpster divers. So I thought, God, how have they managed to do that? If you look on the top, the beef's not even reduced. And it's through carbon offsets. And so we need to ask ourselves, is it acceptable to be offsetting these kind of practices when this food could and should be sold to local Swedish consumers? We've got the USA, 91 billion kilos of food waste every single year in that country. 30% goes to landfill. You might be expecting that this is from a large US city. You're wrong. This is Omaha, Nebraska, in the right in the heart of that country. Um, it doesn't have to be like that. The USA, believe it or not, has some of the most progressive legislation when it comes to commercial food waste donations. In 1996, the Bill Emerson Food Donation Good Samaritan Act got introduced at a federal level, minimizing liability for the supermarket and nonprofits. Um, but even today, after 25 years and all those tax breaks, only 20% of supermarket food waste gets donated. Unfortunately, La France, baguettes and croissants in the dumpster, how dare they? France, 2016, one of uh, the countries that uh, introduced one of the most progressive legislations, or so they say on paper, uh, it only covers supermarkets 400 square meters and above, and the issue is that it's not strict enough. It's mostly facilitating donations to, super, uh, to food banks, and that's why today there is still 1.3 billion kilos of supermarket food waste happening in their country. Look closely, we've got canned chickpeas and apple juice, uh, apple products, and all sorts of things. 
the United Kingdom, uh, the COP26 host. On the left-hand side, we've got an urban harvester in Northern Ireland from Marks and Spencers. On the right-hand side, Tesco from the inside from a whistleblower. The United Kingdom is one of the hardest places to dumpster dive or skipping, as it used to be called in British culture, because supermarkets go to such great lengths to, to hide this stuff. They have specific refrigerated rooms to hide this food waste from homeless people and students to then turn all this food waste into biogas. Uh, well, to eco-gas, I mean, but biogas is what they call it. Uh, the British government has given $750 million in sub, uh, pounds in subsidies to this, but Tesco at least is the retailer in the country that gives the most to charity, 14%. The COP26 sponsor Sainsbury's, majority owned by the Qatari state, only donate 4%, well below the UK average of 9%. Now, even that, 9%, we're a long way off the USA at 20%. So why does all this matter? Well, food waste matters because of the biodiversity crisis. The food system and its food waste, we waste 40% of food at least from farm to fork. A new study came out this summer by the WWF, financed by Tesco, ironically. But at least they've got some good intentions. Um, so that food system uses 50% of the Earth's ice-free land. It causes 80% of global deforestation. We've got a million species potentially going extinct within decades because of uh, the way we use the land. Uh, and so why are we accepting 40% of food waste? Hu food waste matters because of human hunger. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres described global food waste as an ethical outrage. And I couldn't agree more with him. Food waste on this scale naturally impacts global food prices, therefore pricing out those least well off. And it's often folks in the global south. We have 690 million people who still go hungry today. And that's, that came before COVID. Uh, Three billion people still cannot afford a healthy diet. On the right-hand side, March 21, Glasgow. 200 people waiting for a soup in a blizzard. Uh, the United Kingdom has more food banks than McDonald's and Burger Kings put together. Welcome to the sixth largest economy on the planet. And remember, only 9% of supermarket food waste gets donated to that extensive uh, food bank system. And so remember all those uh, dumpsters that I showed you um, it, that have come recently uh, with all that supermarket food waste? Well, let's take a quick tour about global food banks. This is Texas uh, last year. 6,000 people waiting for food uh, at their local food bank. Germany, 2020. France, 2020. Finland. And finally, Australia. It goes on and on. So we're all here at the COP. We've traveled from across the planet to talk about climate change. Let's do that. Um, if food waste were a country, where would it rank on the list? Well, it'd be number three, behind China and the USA. 10% of annual global greenhouse gas emissions come from food waste. This is a massive opportunity. Project Drawdown, the US Climate Solutions Organization, uh, have identified the top 100 solutions available for mankind to mitigate climate change. For the ambitious scenario of 1.5 degrees by 2100, it comes in at number three. But considering there's been 1.2 degrees warming already, unfortunately, two degrees by 2100 is more realistic. And for that, reduced food waste comes in at number one. What an opportunity. So what are countries doing about it? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is very little. Only 6% of Paris Agreement signatories have food waste goals and targets in their national carbon plans. So it's disappointing to see that food waste is not prioritized more. What can the United Nations do about this? Well, in 2015, they released this, uh, their SDGs, and basically food waste comes under number 12, especially 12.3. I've taken the definition and split it into two. This is how the United Nations works to fight food waste. I don't particularly agree with it, uh, but let's take number one. By 2030, half per capita global food waste at the retail and consumer levels. Excellent. We've got a goal, 50% by 2030. Let's work towards that and make progress. Number two, this is where things start going downhill. Reduce food losses along production and supply chains, including post-harvest losses. So if we reduce food loss by 1%, 
we've successfully met our goal. It lacks focus, it lacks ambition, and again, we're missing out on this huge opportunity we have to meet the biodiversity, climate, and social crises. And again, why are we splitting up food waste into food loss and food waste? When a supermarket, for example, cancels a last minute order, uh, an order last minute with their farmer, why is our accounting system putting all that food waste, food loss on the farmer? This, syst this problem is massively interconnected along the supply chain. So I just think we're going about it in quite a, an ir irrational way. But I'm very proactive and positive in my work. Um, there are reasons for hope, and let's start off with technology. GS1 is the nonprofit that sets the global business standards on the planet. They're most famous for the barcode, and at the moment we've got the one-dimensional barcode. Not that interesting, we've got very little data in that barcode. But we've got new technology that's being rolled out in Australia and Norway already, the two-dimensional barcode, and that offers infinitely more opportunities in terms of data and essentially streamlining operations through more efficiency possibilities. We've got Delegate and Wasteless, two solutions that offer dynamic pricing for supermarkets because economics is by far the most effective way of solving all this supermarket food waste. We have got Y Waste, the Swedish company that offers artificial intelligence solutions to improve forecasting at the supermarket level. Throw No More, a company I've actually just started working for now, a Norwegian app that basically uh, digitalizes all those reduced products in store. So after a long day at work, you could be chilling in your lounge and you could explore all those reduced products and your local supermarkets. So you could know, oh wow, Tesco have got a lot on offer that day, 75%, excellent. I'm gonna pop by and buy a lot of that because it's a brilliant offer. Uh, and by making that information more available, you increase the likelihood of selling. Sugo, a Latin American company, uh, e-commerce platform that takes food surplus at manufacturer and retail level and then sells it at a discount to uh, online consumers. And then Phoenix, a French company that links um, excess food uh, from retailers and manufacturers to food banks with that French legislation that gives tax breaks to incentivize that good behavior. Economics, this is my favorite. Um, so on the right-hand side, we've got the waste hierarchy, and we should always be aiming at the top. So reduction and, and prevention. Then, of course, we should always prioritize people, then livestock, uh, and then the composting and, and aerobic digestion. And finally, the last thing we should be doing is landfill and incineration. And all the photos you saw from Denmark, unfortunately, is going to incineration. So we have to design a tax and fiscal system that incentivizes uh, the right behavior. And so basically, supermarket food waste, uh, they have a massive over oversupply. And so they need, they need to drop the price in relation to that legal best before date to encourage selling. But the problem right now is that the cost of wasting that pristine food is not high enough. So these powerful businesses have got pr uh, business models where they factor in that waste, between 1% and 5%, depending on the product. Um, so, that, so that is an issue, and a food waste tax could change that uh, by, by shifting the cost-benefit benefit analysis. And of course, that would accelerate technological update because there is an initial investment. Be wary of green solutions. As I said earlier, the UK government is prioritizing biogas. Well, the issue is it takes a lot of energy to produce that food in the first place. That biogas of that one ton of tomatoes, it only recovers 0.75% of the initial energy used to grow that food. Hence that hierarchy that we have to respect. Better food labeling. On the bottom, we see all these different um, labels that we see. Many consumers are confused by it. Um, so we need to simplify the system. A lot of these food labels are actually much more to do with food quality from the manufacturer to ensure you know, return custom than it has to do with food safety. A French yogurt manufacturer showed that yogurt 45 days past its use-by date was still perfectly edible from a microbiological perspective. Zero health risk. And finally, we need a robust and accurate baseline um, of food waste today so that when we set those targets for the future, we know we've got firm foundation from which to work on. We need to make, uh, we need to make reporting and measuring mandatory with independent verification to ensure that that data is legitimate. At the moment, it's mostly supermarkets who are supplying this to governments. 
All this demands some financial and human resources, so governments need to step up with that. And let's set some legally binding food waste reduction target. 50% by 2030 seems quite ambitious to me. Let's do it from farm to fork. And with that in mind, I've been working on a campaign with some folks in Denmark, Malspilskel i kun betelsa, basically, Food waste shouldn't pay for itself. And at the moment in our system, it pays to waste food, or well, a portion of it at least. Uh, so we're going to release a citizen's proposal to get 50,000 signatures for Danish parliament to debate that uh, food waste measuring and reporting, and make it legal, uh, because Denmark's got one of the highest uh, ambitions for uh, greenhouse gas reductions, and f food waste is 4% of the Denmark's um, emissions. So let's try and work towards that. Uh, we're also doing a national dumpster diving campaign, which I'm excited about. But of course, supermarkets could end this tomorrow if they wanted to. And so I'm calling on supermarkets to do the right thing and end this economic sham, start reducing those products, invest in the technologies available, and let's sell that food to consumers because that's what they're in, your, in business to do. That's it from me. Let's take some questions. I was told that we've got mics at either end. Um, and yeah. Any questions, please go ahead. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, question over here. Hi, thanks, that was uh, great. Um, great photos as well. Um, I was just wondering, uh, one issue I assume with the economics is that they work out that consumers kind of demand full shelves, full choice all the time when they go in. So. Is, is some of the blame on our behavior as consumers and do we need to get used to near the end of the day seeing selections sort of go down so that we start actually stocking the right amount of stuff and we have to cope with the fact we might not get what we want at 10 p.m. on a Friday, for example? Uh, or is the responsibility more on bring, governments bringing in this kind of tax or incentive to just stop the waste so that the supermarkets have to absorb it all, um, or some kind of balance, I guess. Thanks. G great question. Um, the idea with a tax, people often get scared by that. Uh, the idea is not to raise more government money. The idea is to have um, yeah, that potential penalty to change the behavior. But you're right. Consumers, at the moment, uh, expect full shelves at the, end of the, at the end of the day. And that's a major issue. So supermarkets should start communicating that this is not normal. I mean, there's no way that you should expect fresh bread at 10, 10 p.m. at your, uh, your local Marks and Spencers. So definitely, consumers are part of this um, re-education that is needed. Uh, my, I only had 20 minutes, so that's why I focused today on supermarket food waste. And the thing is, actually, supermarket food waste goes much further up the supply chain through those cancelled orders, for example. Um, yes, so... But the thing is, we consumers are paying for all this waste because we can be sure that supermarkets aren't paying for that. Of course, they've got some losses, but it's all factored into their pricing strategies. Uh, so yes, consumers need to change, as do supermarkets, and government can accelerate uh, the solutions uptake. Yes. Yeah, I know, uh, Mike, it's just because of the recording. So thanks very much for the very inspiring and illustrative talk. Um, I come from Peru. I'm a congressman there, and I'm really blown away by this. And I'm wondering if you know or you can refer us to someone who knows the situation in Latin America, how much impact does it have? Because consumption patterns and economical dynamics are, are different there. And I wonder how would that work out in, in that, such a different setup? Definitely. Um, I focus on the global north today because supermarkets are kind of what I was talking about today. But I know in, the, in countries like Peru, for example, we have a lot more food markets uh, where there's a lot of food waste. So the food waste situation is different there. Uh, in terms of who might know, there will definitely be people, uh, the FAO, I imagine, who will, who will know things on the ground. And then the founder of Sugo is a Peruvian, Jean-Pierre whose surname I forget right now. So I could connect you with him. Um, so he would know a lot about the situation of food waste in, in uh, Peru and Latin America in general. Any other questions? Yes, one more over here. Thank you so much for raising awareness about this huge problem. 
I feel uh, fortunate because in my neighborhood, I live in Belgium, I have a sort of a supermarket which is uh, organic, uh, responsible, sells only things that are local, and so I don't have this horrible thing on my conscience. Uh, my question is, do you think boycotting uh, supermarket is one of the solution that um, people that don't have this kind of store close to them can do in their, in their life to, uh, to put pressure at least on the system so that we change? And, and what way uh, can we make uh, the supermarket know that it's for that reason that we don't go to this shop? Great question. Um... Yeah, I mean, supermarkets, in a way, are part of the problem. Uh, the reason why I have become more pragmatic, because I love those zero-waste shops, the organic stores, they're fabulous, and they do such important work. But the reality is that for a lot of people, A, they're perhaps not the most affordable. Perhaps also consumers don't have the time to go to there, whereas, you know, a supermarket is a convenient place to, to do their weekly shop. Um, so absolutely, I always encourage folks uh, to explore options uh, outside the supermarket system. Um, but given the market share that supermarkets have in, in Europe and, and North America, I have to work towards solving that issue because, because they are the, the dominant way that people uh, buy their food at the moment. But I agree. I am always for alternatives, absolutely. Yes, just the mic over here, sir. Uh, we've just oh, got one oh, question. Over here, on this yes, side. yes. Hello. Hello. Thank you for this interesting uh, topic and the raising of awareness. Uh, I come from Nigeria, Africa. Where I come from, uh, we live in a place with a high rate of poverty. But then you look, you see like uh, there are so much uh, food waste within the community. So I'm thinking of who are we to blame at, uh, looking at what you said. Is it the individual or the companies or the government? Because I'm um, lost. We are hungry, and we see a lot of food west out there. Thank you. It's a complex topic, and it does vary from country to country, especially, um, yeah. I mean, I, I read a book about uh, the this global situation of the 17th history, and merchants and hoarding of food has been a problem throughout the world and throughout history. I mean... Japanese folks apparently were cutting the heads off merchants in the 17th century who were caught hoarding rice and wheat. My point with that is that we shouldn't go back to those barbaric times. My point is that food has always been political and a way of making profit. So when you tell me that there's a lot of poverty in Nigeria and yet there's remarkable food waste levels, that is a huge paradox. And so I believe that legislation and legislators can bring about solutions. I can't tell you what the exact solution is for Nigeria, but there's a way to do this because clearly there's a massive oversupply and there's a lot of people who want that food, but the economics don't match up. I'm not an economist per se. I've come from it very much from a biology and climate change background, so I definitely lack answers. My goal is to try and raise the awareness of this so that we get talking about it and solve this because this isn't rocket science. Uh, but it does demand resources and time to, to try and solve it. But thanks for your question. Very impressive pictures. I knew, I knew the numbers before, but when I see the pictures, it goes much deeper, and it feels very uncomfortable, I must say. Um, my question is, uh, more and more people actually ordering groceries at home. So where do you look, how do you look at this? Does this make the problem? bigger or is this part of the solution? Excellent question. Um, is that, two seconds, is that online retail via big businesses or could it be smaller businesses? Or both? Both. Um, you're right. Um, it's an interesting question. That's happening more and more quickly. Um, but we know that online retailers do have major issues. For example, I see Amazon reports coming out every six months about how Amazon's wasted, uh, like, you know, burning hundreds of thousands of uh, computers, for example. So this food waste situation, it goes much beyond food. Um, when it comes to food and retail, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at the data, but that is happening, and it's been happening much more quickly since COVID. So we need to, to, to see what's happening. And again, it's, it comes back to that legal uh, reporting and measuring so that we know what's happening now and what's happening in the future so we, can, so we know where we are. At the moment, we're basically in the dark, and that's the big problem. I know that smaller online businesses that I support in Denmark, for example, you know, when you're a smaller business, you can't afford waste on this scale, I imagine. 
Um, but perhaps they do. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but I need to look into that more. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'd just firstly like to acknowledge my uh, privileged, privileged position as being uh, someone who lives in the UK. Um, but my question is this. Um, the percentage of um, uh, our disposable income that we now uh, use to buy food has significantly reduced over the decades. So is the part of the problem that food is too cheap and therefore as consumers we are quite happy to let it go to waste? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, food waste actually also happens, as we all know, on a massive scale at home. The reason why I don't focus on that is because that really is irrational. I mean, when we do that, we're literally throwing our money out the window. Um, so, yes, consumers are very much part of the global food waste problem. Uh, we do spend too little money today on, on food relative uh, to the past. Uh, of course, we don't want to go up to 50% disposable go income going to, f uh, to food like some countries still do, especially in the global south. But, you know, in the UK, I think it's about 9%. That's probably too low. We're also buying the wrong foods often, too much processed foods, and we see that on the country's waistline, and not just the UK, right across the global north. So, of course, the less we spend on food, often it has not just environmental impacts, it has human health impacts. So we need to prioritize you know, healthy diets, uh, well-balanced diets, full of full, whole foods, not too many processed foods also. So absolutely, consumers are part of, of this issue and we must change our ways for, for many reasons, not just social and environmental. Okay, well, I think we, that's it from questions from here. And I see the time's up. So I'd like to thank you very much for being here today. And I wish you an excellent rest of your COP26. So thank you all very much. <laughs>